And so I hope to see you at 9 o'clock Friday. Morning, everybody. Um, about a month ago, Pastor Paul gave a message that involved a little boy who was bidding on a basketball. And at the end of the message, he said, who have you bought a basketball for lately? Well, if you notice, there are three in the back. So if you know someone who needs a basketball, or if you need one, please give someone a basketball. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, please join me in the call to worship. Bless the Lord, O people sing. Come and hear what the Lord has done. The Lord has Let us worship God. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 302, I Dance in the Morning, verses 1, 2, and 5.
Christ be with you. And also with you. Please pass the peace of Christ to one another. <laughs> First scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with the second verse. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, quote, 
See, I am laying a stone uh, in Zion, a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner. And, quote, a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumbled because they disobeyed the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy.
And our scripture lesson comes from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Jesus, the way of the Father. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many more places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know the way where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe in me. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. When you are in one of your most severe crises, the last thing you can hear is often the one thing you need to hear. There you are, in the hospital waiting room, pacing back and forth in a room full of strangers whose faces suggest that they are there carrying similar burdens as you are. Or they might be clutching a, a styrofoam cup, flipping pages through a magazine you, you would otherwise never read, but it's what's there on the table and you'll do anything to keep fear at bay and the minutes moving rapidly along. Or you are thinking about the future, which is impossible to imagine after a particular loss. You hear the devastating news of, of terror in the world and in our country once again, and again, and again. You read the articles online, or see the news uh, channels, and then maybe another one, and another one, uh, an addict for, for more, more community maybe, more news, more assurance, more whatever, and the channels all cover the same thing again and again. The crashing in front of you are not just uh, these images, or maybe the markets, but something far more profound is being shaken. A, a security, once assumed secure, is unmasked as an illusion. What's coming next, uh, when and where, uh, where are we safe anymore? So we rush out to the store to make sure we have what we need. It, it makes perfectly good sense to be prepared. But even preparation and evacuation plans don't take away the unsettledness of our inner lives. This may be with us for a lifetime in, in the age that we are in. Nevertheless, in the midst of it all, let not your heart be troubled, Jesus says. Believe in God. Jesus' assurance is hard to hear. Often we don't hear it. Uh, on the lips of anyone, but Jesus, it can sound sentimental uh, or too much like a nervous attempt at uh, consolation by someone who can't bear the silence of anguish. We've all experienced the simple and well meaning, don't worry, as less than comforting when the person offering it has no clue of the actual reason for the worry that is presently eating up at your stomach. Uh, when you're holding a uh, memo of termination in, the, in your 40s or 50s or 60s or Whenever, without a job in sight, and it doesn't help when your securely employed buddy pats him on the back and says, don't worry, it'll work out. Now, he may be right, of course, but it's hard to hear that in the moment. Jesus himself had a troubled heart when his friend Lazarus died. He wept. And when Judas was preparing to betray him, he wept again, only this time in the Garden of Gethsemane, with such anguish that drops of blood spilled from his brow. Jesus knows trouble. And he knows a troubled heart. And he also knows your heart and his mind. Preparing his disciples for a future after his death, something incomprehensible to them, he offers the word they and we need to hear. The word we have sometimes the most difficulty hearing, and yet the one we most need to hear for our freedom. This is not the sentimental consolation of a person uncomfortable with grief, 
or the hallmark message one is obliged to give and receive because, well, because it's the thing you do in circumstances where you can do nothing else. In other words, this is not a human word. This is God's word for a troubled heart. God's word is not a momentary escape from pain, but a gift that allows you to live with eyes open and with courage. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus says. Believe in God, believe in me. Will you hear this today as an invitation to trust your life, your whole, the whole of it, your present, your past, your future, in God's care? This is the message some of us find the most difficult to embrace, truly to embrace as the truth, not merely as a religious sentiment, like, oh, that sounds nice, because we want something more secure. Yet if anything has become clear is, is that nothing we can construct is secure. Living with honesty about the ultimate insecurity of human security is the freedom that allows you to trust your life into God's care. This is true security and true freedom. And Jesus offers himself. Uh, the way is personal. Jesus is the way. The, the truth is personal. Jesus is the truth. The life is personal. Jesus is the life. You will find life not in propositions, but in a person, a particular person. Jesus of Nazareth, who came to announce and inaugurate the reign of God. This is interesting when we think about um, travel, so this is going to shift a, a, a little bit uh, when we think about personal and corporate and impersonal settings, but uh, be thinking about this as we go through, through this part of the sermon. Uh, where do you like to stay when you travel? When you're heading out and about and you find yourself uh, not at home, uh, do you seek out a, a luxury five-star all-inclusive resort? Uh, maybe something on the higher end, or you look for the uh, the lower end on the travel velocity, or travel zoo, whatever the one you look at. Or are you a packing, pack out kind of camper? Maybe you rely on the guest rooms and pull out couches of family members or friends traveling by family across the country or in different states. While some would argue that there are other things that matter more than where you stay, your lodging choice can be a big difference on how the trip goes. And we tend to have our own preferences. So as we read the reviews online, which gives us a wealth of information, hopefully, hoping for reasonably priced places that will fit our list of wants, it can be a tedious process, whether you are researching the best place to park your family RV or finding the perfect beachfront to hotel with ocean views. In the end, we want to know what to expect and hope to find the perfect fit for our needs to make the, a truly memorable trip. In our Gospel reading this morning, Jesus in the midst of what is known as his farewell discourse uh, to his disciples, where he does far more uh, than telling them about a great trip he has planned with mom and dad to a cozy spot on the Sea of Galilee. The stakes of his journey are tremendous, and his explaining them to the disciples has caused understandable grief. In this passage, we hear Jesus offering words of comfort, reminders that his trip will not separate him from his disciples forever, Instead, quite the opposite would be true. They will be reunited with him. And naturally, the disciples want to know what it is going to be like and how to get there. Thomas is the one who is bold enough to ask the question. Now, in response, we would expect Jesus to paint a clear picture. After all, throughout his ministry, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, he has described what the kingdom of heaven is like, a, a mustard seed, a, a great treasure, a generous landowner in the vineyard, a pearl. And yet, he doesn't seem to spend much time on a list of amenities. It's as if he has already told the disciples what they need to know. It is his father's house, and there is space for everyone, and he is preparing the way. Throughout the centuries, Christians have tried to paint a bigger, more dramatic picture of what this must mean. Uh, images of big, pearly gates and a grand estate with golden robes. It's natural for us to want to get a glimpse of what the father's house will look like. Totally natural. Or at least to imagine some of the splendor that is to come. And like we sometimes do with our vacation plans, we can get caught up in the, the list of amenities and luxuries. We want to book our room and secretly hope we'll be upgraded to a penthouse suite. Wouldn't that be nice? Our view of eternity is almost like we're guests in God's hotel. Now, when you're a hotel guest, you view things as a customer. Things become a business transaction in which you give something to the hotel in exchange for services. If the services don't meet your standards, you can call the front desk and complain to the manager in the hopes of some resolution. You are a consumer, free from the responsibilities you normally have at home. I've heard of people who, even on vacation in a hotel, will make the bed and get in arguments with other family members who won't do that since someone would come and do it for them. And 
see this argument happening if it hasn't happened in, in your family. Some people, of course, take the convenience to the extreme in the other direction and leave a mess. Rock stars are stereotypically notorious for this. While I'm sure that none of you would ever trash a hotel room like a, like a rock star, if we're really honest, I imagine we don't put too much thought into how it looks when we leave for the day or the trip. That's normal for the hotel guests, right? Jesus' response to the disciples' question makes it pretty clear that what he's talking about is more than a vacation reservation. He responds to Thomas not as a travel agent trying to sell the upgraded room, but as the Savior who knows what is truly at the heart of the matter. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. In other words, I've got you covered, Thomas. Trust me, friend, it's going to be good. Jesus knows that the reservation will be made by his death and resurrection, that grace will cover all the costs, and he knows he's doing much more than plain travel agent. What Jesus is offering isn't a short-term vacation opportunity or even a fantastic deal on some eternal real estate. He's not really selling anything at all. Rather, he's inviting his friends to come and live with him. They're going to be paying customers. They're going to be house guests. Being someone's house guest is very different from renting a room. Our expectations aren't the same when staying with friends and family. We generally don't experience a daily turndown service, mints on our pillows, those things, or tiny bottles of shampoo and lotion. Instead, we tend to focus more on the time we get to spend with our loved ones. Things feel a bit more like home when we fall into a shared rhythm and routine together over morning cups of coffee, or rocking on the front porch, local adventures and shared reminiscing. Of course, our hosts will do things to make us as comfortable as possible. Uh, they've probably done some cleaning up to prepare for our arrival and have and will want to show us where we can find things around the house. They uh, say, make yourself at home and show us where to find extra towels and late night snacks. They may even give us their Wi-Fi password. But chances are, during our stay, we aren't that focused on the amenities or luxuries of the accommodations. They are replaced by something far more important, the relationships. This is what Jesus is really talking about in this passage, relationships. Not just in the far off future of eternity, but in the very immediate reality of the present. He reminds the disciples that through him they are already connected to God the Father. They have begun an intimate relationship with the divine host. Through Christ they have laughed with God, dined with God, walked with God. They have witnessed God's incredible powers to heal and reach out into the world. They have truly experienced God, not as some future being to meet, but as someone who is a part of their lives even now. And Jesus' farewell discourse is meant to encourage them to live more deeply into that relationship with God in the present. He summarizes what that means in this passage by identifying the role of good works, not as a way to get to God, that's already been done through Christ, but as a response to God dwelling within each of them and as a way to glorify God in this time and place. The Theologians call this sanctification, the ongoing process of living holy lives that remind us of God's presence with us and seek to praise God in all that we say and all that we do. Jesus reminds the disciples that these works give hints of the even greater works that he will do in God's name and it will be the glimpse of what is to come. The key to this kind of living uh, focus on the relationship they have with God and one another. Now, here in this passage today, we are challenged to consider what our relationship with God is, is most like. Do we approach it as a hotel guest with a list of desired amenities and consumer mentality, or do we approach it like you're going to visit a dear friend or family member? Chances are, actually, the answer is truthfully a little bit of both. We trend toward the consumer approach sometimes. We remember to pray more when there is something we particularly want or need. We may arrive at church looking for what we can get out of our time here, ready to be served and hoping not to be disappointed by a, a less than stellar sermon again. When we think about God as often convenient for us, which might be less often than we'd like to admit, rather than making all our spiritual lives a priority. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we're pretty quick to complain to the heavenly management when things aren't the way we like. Now, this mentality isn't all bad. Jesus even indicates that he will provide for us in verse 14 of our scripture passage. We trust in God's power and grace to be able to do anything, even more than what we ask. And there is certainly nothing wrong with asking God, with asking God to help us or others, or to expect that our time together as a community of faith will benefit us. 
It absolutely should. But that's not where our relationship with God should end. I think we have an innate desire as human beings to connect in meaningful ways, and it's even seen in our, our travel trends. All over the world, people are opening their homes to guests through programs like Airbnb, which, if you haven't uh, heard of it, uh, means you can rent out your house or a room in your house through their online service to just about any, anyone who can pay uh, your rate set up on that website. And in one commercial, the company is presented like this. Uh, a mother juggles a, a tote bag full of groceries and baby bottles, trying to get them to fit into a hotel room uh, mini fridge, as her husband notes that every time she moves one of the uh, original overpriced snacks, you know they're going to charge us for that. Then the scene cuts to the same family entering a home with a room for the kids to play and a large spacious fridge big enough for an assortment of items only Mary Poppins could produce from that same bag. And the mom smiles and takes a deep breath. This travel movement accomplishes a lot of things and meets a new set of needs for travelers. But it also represents in us, I think, the desire to be more connected with each other and for our travels to feel more rooted in our own realities as we try to find places that feel like home. It shifts the focus of our trip to the relationships we have, and even opens the doors to some new relationships, depending on whether or not the owners of the house are around. Uh, many who have enjoyed these types of accommodations have noted the joy of shared cups of coffee as cultures are exchanged. It, it can be fun to engage with the host. R. Greg Boyle, in his book, Tattoos on the Heart, wants to put it like this. The wrong idea has taken root in the world, and the idea is this, there just might be some lives out there that matter less than other lives. Boyle runs uh, Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, helping gang members to get out of gangs and into a new way of life. So Boyle was traveling to give a few speeches about his work, he does this extensively, uh, just like uh, he goes to many different places. On, on one occasion, he, he took Richie and Chepe with him, I hope I have that pronounced right, and they went to a restaurant called Coco's. Coco's was, as Boyle puts it, one notch above Denny's and one notch below everywhere else. Now when they walked in, they encountered the hostess who made no secret about the fact that she was strongly, that she strongly disapproved of Boyle's tattooed dinner companions. She didn't move from behind her hostess station. She just kind of waited for them to get the hint and go away. This, of course, made Boyle furious. Instead of leaving, he played a game of charades with her. He played, he played dumb as if just as if uh, um, she didn't know that they were there. He, he was holding up the number three, you know, kind of pointing to each other, making motions with his hands, pretending to, to sit at the table. This is what we want to do. And then finally she grabs three menus and takes the trio to the back of the restaurant, where there are no other diners nearby. Everyone's looking at us, Richie uh, whispers. We don't belong here, Chepe chimes in. Don't be ridiculous, Boyle replies, and they sit down to eat. Their discomfort lasted until the waitress arrived. And for whatever reason, she was a whole different person than the hostess and all the other diners. She put her arms around Chepe and Richie, talked with them, joked with them, asked about them, called them sweetie and honey, and brought them refills they didn't even ask for. You can imagine this in some of the best diners you've ever experienced. And the story continues. What that waitress didn't know, what she couldn't have known, was that Chepe and Richie had never been in a restaurant where you sit down to eat as someone serves you. But she treated those guys like they were her favorite customers. After they left, one of them said with satisfaction and wonder, she treated us like we were somebody. Ray Boyle had a more explicitly theological interpretation. He writes, she was Jesus in the name. In God's house, we find the best kind of host. We are welcomed with warm and open arms as beloved children who have come home. We settle into the Father's house and we are reminded of, of past memories. We reminisce with God about good times and bad, laughing and crying together until the wee hours of the morning. We learn more about the place we are staying and get insider tips that make our experience more authentic, rather than falling into tourist traps with cheap thrills. We are more inclined to lend a hand and we might even tidy the covers up a bit and hang out our towels in the morning. When we approach our faith journey more like house guests than customers, something shifts inside of us. We realize that our time with God involves giving of ourselves to God and to each other so that we can all go together as a family of faith. We sing out in worship, not worrying if our voices are a little bit off key. 
We speak out the Bible study, not worrying if our ideas about scripture are perfectly phrased or even completely correct. We volunteer in service, not worrying about being the most qualified. Just wanting to help as best as we are able to meet the need to exercise our gifts and time for others. As house guests, we have the boldness to do these things because we trust we are in a safe place with our host, who will be with us every step of the way. As God's house guests, we can linger in this place without worrying about a checkout time, but with God, we are home. The invitation to us has already been made some 2,000 years ago and will extend into eternity. But we don't have to wait to accept it. We can live as God's house guests now, dwelling with Christ in us today. The Father's house can be wherever we are. The light is always on for us to come and stay. As the psalmist reminds us, this is a good and joyful place to be. You won't find better amenities anywhere else than God's grace and love. So come and stay a while. There's a place prepared for you. And while you are here, let us enjoy this time with the Lord and with one another in the house of the Lord. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 288, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Please stand as we sing. Last week, we got to uh, participate in the National Day of Prayer, uh, praying for our country, and uh, here locally, praying for uh, local leaders and local services, uh, teachers and schools and everything. 
Uh, and uh, it's, it's an opportunity that, uh, that I love to be part of. Uh, and so this is something from the Minister Alliance. Uh, we had a, a good showing from the community and also from our church. Thank you for those that were able to make it. Uh, and we look forward to doing this again next year as well. So we are really looking forward uh, to that. We'll continue to be praying for our nation for all those needs that are going on. You probably have read or heard about what's happened in Allen, Texas, the, the latest uh, mass uh, shooting. Uh, we'll be looking at their uh, town, that, that state, and, and our country as well as we experience this again. If there are no other prayer requests, let's go with the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you. We thank you for the ways that you have come back to assure us, uh, come back to, to tell us uh, to, to not be troubled in a troubled time. Lord, we thank you for those days that we can go and be about in our community and enjoying times with family when things are going well. And thank you, Lord, that for being us with us in those times when we seem to be reading more and more bad things that are happening. And in the midst of uh, days to days of, of mixed uh, things that are going on. We ask that you will also be with us. And we hear this word of not being troubled. Um, help us to follow you in that, to wrestle with that uh, when it seems like our hearts are troubled. By one thing or another, things going on in our world or nation, things going on closer to home, and things that we, we wrestle with uh, during this time. Help us to trust you into those prayers and into those expressions as we bring ourselves and those situations before Lord, we thank you for prayer and this opportunity. Lord, we pray for our prayer list uh, for Nick Weaver and family, for Madeline Walden, uh, Gloria Marston, uh, Brent, all those in different uh, health needs of one form or another, or uh, experiencing transitions in health and, and things that are going on in their lives. We do pray for uh, their flourishing in the midst of those times uh, where it might be very difficult. Certainly, Lord, we lift up all those that are suffering from addiction of one form or another, and we pray for them, for their next steps, the organizations and resources they need to come alongside, um, that they might be able to do those uh, as they try to deal with those um, conditions. We do pray for peace in Ukraine, as we keep on hearing about and seeing uh, incendiary bombs and different sorts of warfare unleashed on towns and, and people. Help us to keep coming back, praying for peace and for the miracles needed for that to happen. Uh, protect, protect all those that are caught in the midst of this, for the families that have sought refuge in nearby countries and around the world, uh, for their organizations seeking to help them and the resources they need as they try to deal with uh, keeping families intact or trying to stay safe in different countries. Uh, be with all those uh, people and, and people, governments even, that are seeking to help. We pray for the, the work happening at Willow Tree on, on Friday, that they might be able to um, have uh, workers for that as Willow Tree continues to work on their uh, building a facility, welcoming people in and uh, being about their, their mission. We pray that they might be able to get the resources they need and the workers. And, uh, may that work go well on, on Friday. Thank you, Lord, for hearing uh, response to uh, sermons and movements of the heart for getting basketballs or whatever it might be that we might be able to um, honor the needs around us and find ways um, uh, to do these fun things and also the things that are, are, are needed to meet the needs. Guide our hearts and our, our church. Uh, help us to be about these sorts of practices continually for the ways we've done this in the past or doing it now with that and also the way these will inspire us in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you for a, a wonderful prayer breakfast, and uh, we do pray for all those communities and churches and organizations across the, the nation that we're lifting up and praying for our nation, uh, praying for their, their local uh, organizations, uh, for the, the police and EMTs and teachers and, and uh, schools. May those continue to be blessed uh, and be with them. Lord, for the, the communities that have gone through devastation, um, or for Allen, Texas, we lift them up as they are grieving right now. We pray for those that are fighting for their life right now, being hospitalized from this latest shooting, pray for the families of those who have passed away from it. Uh, we do, Lord, pray for an ending to these sorts of things in our country and around the world, as we've been thinking about in other countries as well. Uh, help us to do those things that might bring uh, 
uh, to life. Um, help us to make life and giving decisions, and whether it might be locally, uh, on the stage, or the nation, we know that this is not an easy conversation or idea to have. And we do pray for all those that are part of it, that we might be able to approach it with wisdom and, and carefulness, that we might be able to see uh, better fruit uh, from the decisions we make than the ones that we are seeing currently. We pray for those uh, announcements and the things in our calendar when we lift up uh, next Sunday as we seek to honor the, the graduates uh, the week before they go through graduation, uh, whether it be through high school or college. Thank you for the, that um, uh, big mind step that they are, are taking. Uh, may we uh, be able to honor them in, in ways that will be uh, wonderful as we help to be part of the community that sends them off into the next steps. Um, so we will be able to do that with the cards we have in the back and also to, to do that next week. And also for next week being Mother's Day. You know, let that not just be uh, a single day, a single Sunday that we do that, but let that be throughout the year as well. But we, Lord, thank you for those opportunities that we've got with you to express uh, thanks to the mothers that we have uh, grown up with, uh, uh, the mothers amongst us, uh, and all women that seek to um, help out uh, our community uh, that, that can act as mothers for uh, uh, those amongst us. For all the ways that you've uh, gifted us with them, help us to seek to honor them on that day and throughout the year. Uh, be with uh, the different things we see for concerts coming up, uh, for the Bible studies, uh, for the opportunities for fellowship uh, out in the in Allerton, Vacation Bible School, may that be blessed as well. And also be with the meaning and all prayer requests that we haven't heard out loud. Be with those relationships and people and uh, things that uh, might be particular to our heart and mind. We lift them up to you. We want to see you at work in them. And so help us to pray for it, not just this morning, but throughout the week as we seek to see you at work in those situations where you are moving and where you are calling us out. Help us also to meet your hands and feet offering words of encouragement or um, words that we read about in the Bible, words that come from your spirit, or even just being a presence. Guide us that we might continue to do that as individuals, families, and as a church. And help us to encourage one another to do that as well. Lord, we, are, we also want to pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, during this time of offering our tithes and gifts as part of our worship, uh, let, it, let us offer ourselves during the offertory.
different blessings. And we pray that as a thankful people, we might be able to enjoy them and then also to share them as well. As you guide us, help us to step into those ways of generosity that we might be um, a generous people in your image. Lord, thank you for that opportunity and also that responsibility that we have with the things that we are able to enjoy. We pray always in your son's name. Uh, our next hymn is hymn number 322, Spirit of the Living God, which means health times.
Now in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time that you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. God, may we who have received this sacrament live in the unity of your Holy Spirit, that we may show forth your gifts to all the world. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 361, How Firm a Foundation Lead. The first four verses, please stand as we sing.
anticipating miracles, knowing that with God, all things are possible. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with thee both this day and always. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.